Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Baptist Fellowship. We're glad you could join us here this morning. And uh, if you, all the congregation would join us in praising for all the earth.
My wife, Judy, loves personal mail. She loves car, getting cards, she loves getting letters. And uh, so she's really tuned into when the mail person comes. So she'll ask, have you heard the mail truck yet? Or did you get the mail in? Did I get anything? So she's really excited about that personal mail communication. David in Psalm 143 says, Let me hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for I trust in thee. Teach me the way in which I should walk, for to thee I lift up my soul. And Moses also has a similar thought about the morning and hearing from the Lord. In Psalm 90, Moses says, Oh, satisfy us in the morning with thy loving kindness, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. So the process of hearing involves listening, and it may be that the Almighty Father is communicating every morning with me, but I'm not listening as I should be. And all too often, I think I don't quite have that excitement that Judy has about getting personal mail. I don't have that excitement about hearing from the good, good father in the morning. It just hasn't been my focus. I missed opportunities. So I missed opportunities to sing for joy, as Moses says, and to hear the tender whisper of love. Love so undeniable, peace so unexplainable, as he calls me deeper still into love. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are the almighty God, that you are the good, good Father, that you know what we need before we even ask, and you bring joy to our morning. We do pray for listening, Lord, for when you're speaking and seeing you and the things you're doing. Thank you for music and for the lyrics that point us in your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, good morning. Good to see all your happy, smiling faces. For those of you who may be uh, joining us for the first time or for the first few times, I'm Brian, uh, one of the pastors here at Baptist Fellowship, and we're glad you're here. Um, we're welcome. We are glad that you are here and hope that you consider yourself very welcome. Um, if you have any questions, you can, call, you can tackle me in the hallway or Dennis, who is over there, you can ask him any questions. We would be delighted to answer any questions. A few announcements that we have here before we uh, get into the meat of today's um, service is, of course, this uh, marks the end of Vacation Bible School. And so I have a brief report, a great report, actually. There were 47 uh, children who attended. Um, 40 volunteers. We had 40 volunteers. By the way, if you happen to have been volunteering at VBS in any capacity, would you mind standing and give us an opportunity just to, to say thank you and show our appreciation for you? Thank you very much. Let's put our hands together for them. Uh, from their efforts and, and of course, from uh, God's uh, work, 21 uh, children prayed uh, the prayer of salvation or prayed a prayer of assurance of salvation, and so we want to continue to keep them in our prayers. Um, and now um, we get an opportunity to kind of peek in to what happened during that week, and so uh, let's take a look at the VBS video that they've put together for that. We're gonna ride with Jesus Christ Around to be friends, we're on a quest We're heading out in the wild, wild west Just like folks in olden days We're gonna follow God together Jesus Christ is the same Yesterday, today, and forever Saw me at the Sun West Roundup, stomp your feet and shout. Yeehaw! Saddle up for the Sun West Roundup. We're gonna ride, we're gonna ride. Bring your friends to the Sun West Roundup. Grab your hat and shout. Yeehaw! Get along to the Sun West Roundup. We're gonna ride, we're gonna ride, we're gonna ride with Jesus Christ. Yeehaw! Come on now. We're gonna ride, we're gonna ride with Jesus Christ Round up your friends, we're on a quest We're heading out in the wild, wild west Just like folks in olden days We're gonna follow God together Jesus Christ is the same Yesterday, today, and forever Saw me at the Sun West Roundup, stop your feet and shout. Yeehaw! Saddle up for the Sun West Roundup. We're gonna ride, we're gonna ride. Bring your friends to the Sun West Roundup. Grab your hat and shout. Yeehaw! Get along to the Sun West Roundup. We're gonna ride, we're gonna ride, we're gonna ride. We're gonna ride. Again, a big thank you to uh, everybody who participated, and of course, a very uh, big thank you. I don't think Sandy's here, but thank you so much to Sandy Caldwell and Amy Considine, who worked very hard to coordinate all of this, and anyone else who put so much time, my profound uh, thanks, and, and I hope that you get a chance to get a little bit of rest, because I know VBS can be very tiring. <clears throat> also, please pray for the nine students and the four leaders who are now leaving uh, for a life camp this morning. Uh, pray that you be with them. And then also our prayer meeting uh, is on Tuesdays at 6.30 p.m. up in the chapel. We hope uh, that you will feel free to attend. Um, there's still some baby bottles in the foyer for the Caring Families Annual Baby Bottle Fundraiser. Please take some home to fill with change or bills and return uh, by Labor Day. And uh, children are dismissed for uh, junior church. Let's take a minute and uh, go before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we are grateful for 
every blessing that you pour out among us. We're grateful for the days we come and the sun is shining. We're also grateful for the rain that falls. Uh, Lord God, we're thank you, we thank you for these summer days in which uh, we can spend so much time with family and friends out of doors. And Lord, even though we, we wish that summer days would last forever, we know that eventually they come to a close. And so we thank you for the changing of seasons as... Uh, we begin towards this late part of the summer to recognize uh, that seasons do change. Uh, Father, not only <clears throat> do seasons change in the life of our calendar, Lord, seasons change in our own lives. And Father, you know that for many, those changes in seasons can come uh, with some difficulties and challenges. Father, I pray for all of those who, whose health has waned uh, because of the seasons of life changing. May you be with them and help them. May you draw close to them. Father, I pray for all of those who may not be able to make it here on Sunday who have been such an important part of our congregation for so long uh, because of the changing seasons of life. Father, I think of Neil Christopher Lord and <clears throat> his inability to come uh, to church regularly. I think of Roy Lawrence. Uh, Father, uh, there are others who simply cannot make it, and still, some, still more who cannot make it as often. Father, would you be with them and be their comforter in the midst of that time? Father, we know that there are some who are recovering, and Lord God, we pray that you be with them. I think of, of Diane, Lord God, would you help her as she uh, continues to heal from her knee surgery. Father, be with her. Uh, Lord God, I pray that uh, you'd be with Renee Gaucher, Lord, as she continues to battle cancer. Father, Lord, would you place your healing hand upon her. And Father, I think of Rob Soderberg, who ended up having a a minor biking accident. Lord God, would you be with him? Help him to heal quickly. Lord God, would your healing hand fall upon him? Father, I thank you for all the efforts of everyone who has helped to make this day the day that you have made. And Lord God, I thank you for those who work in sound and in video. Lord, I thank you for those who have led the worship this morning. I thank you, Lord God, uh, for those who baked or made the treats that they brought this morning and, and made the coffee. Lord God, thank you for all who are here who participate in what we do on Sunday morning, whether it's teaching Sunday school or junior church. Uh, Lord God, may their efforts be recognized, but most importantly, may they be honored uh, for your glory. And now, Lord, we pray uh, that you would turn our attentions to your word. Uh, Father, would you use me, a broken vessel, Lord, to share your word? Would you open this book and give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear and the hearts to believe what you would tell us through this book, that we may glow closer to you, that we may understand your will and your way, that we may embrace these things of both challenge and give us comfort uh, for their words of life. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. <clears throat> well, if you are joining us here, maybe for the first time or the first few times, um, I am in the middle of a sermon series on uh, theology proper, the persons of God, who is God, and how do we as Christians understand God, and what are some of the misconceptions that you may have encountered as you um, either interface with God outside the church or even interface with God inside the church. And of course, we as a, a Protestant uh, church, uh, the Southern Baptists are the largest Protestant denomination in the country. We believe that, the, that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. We believe in the Trinity. And so I started by teaching a message on the Father, and I've spent a couple of weeks understanding and exploring what it means that God is the Son. And now we're going to be looking at God the Spirit, and I will take probably two weeks to help us to understand uh, God the Spirit. Now, the, the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, depending upon what kind of tradition you come from, 
is a doctrine in the doctrine of God. It's an <clears throat> understanding of God that is often very misunderstood. In traditional Baptist circles, you will hear a lot about God the Father. You will hear an incredible amount about the person of Jesus, and rightly so. Um, you may not always hear so much about the Holy Spirit. And in fact, I think some uh, people are a little scared of the Holy Spirit. They might be a little trepidatious about you know, getting too close to understanding who the Holy Spirit is. And I believe that some of that uh, maybe comes from some of the excesses and errors of, of some um, who claim things are happening by virtue of the Holy Spirit when perhaps maybe they're not. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit plays a very important and active life in the role of every person who has come to a place in their life in which they've trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. In essence, the person of the Holy Spirit is a fundamental presence in the life of everyone who is genuinely a Christian. Everyone. Now, not to jump to the very end necessarily, but of course we as Baptists believe that one must be born again in order to be saved. Now, a lot of people really have some very fundamental misunderstandings as to what that means. For some people, that means that we're part of some fundamentalist branch of Christianity. Uh, for others, that means that, you know, we do certain things, we vote certain ways, we listen to certain kind of musics, and there are certain things that we won't eat and certain things that we won't drink and certain songs that we won't dance to. And uh, that that's what it means to have be born again. But in essence, that is really far from what it means to be born again. To be born again means to have a particular relationship with God through the power of the Holy Spirit. The concept of being born again is a relational term. It's not really a political term. It's not some quasi form of denominational identifier. It's not really even a label that you slap on to some people who call themselves Christians and then avoid for other people who call themselves Christians. <clears throat> but I can't tell you the number of times in conversation in which I accidentally or sometimes on purpose disclose that I'm a pastor, and then usually the question comes along, where are you one of those born-agains? <laughs> It's almost like that's a hyphenated word now. Are you, they run it together, born again, right? Are you one of those born agains? And, and I used to say, yeah, well, it really depends on what kind of a conversation I want to have. If it, I want it to be a short conversation, I'll just say yes and say, I've got some literature, would you like to read it? If I want it to be a long conversation, I have learned to ask the question, Yes, but what do you think that means? And inevitably, what follows if the person is bold enough to engage in the conversation is 100% wrong. That term, born again, is perhaps the most misunderstood term outside of those who have a relationship with Christ. And it is a fundamental aspect of the Christian life and the person of the Holy Spirit and a relationship with the Holy Spirit has one of the most powerful experiences of having a genuine walk with God. <clears throat> now, I know that those are some pretty bold claims, so I'm going to back them up. If you have a Bible, please turn with me to the 14th chapter of the book of John. If you don't happen to have a Bible, there should be one in the pew in front of you. And if not, my hunch is some of these verses are going to show up on the screen behind me. John chapter 14, starting in the first verse, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. This is one of the most interesting passages in all of Scripture as far as I'm concerned. It is often quoted uh, during times of trouble. I use it frequently in my work as a chaplain, and you will often hear it during 
uh, funerals, but, but, but honestly, it's one of those passages that really has more to do with the ongoing life of a believer than it has anything to do with the reflection upon a person's death. In fact, the person who is quoting it most, uh, the person who is giving these assurances and promises is the person of Jesus. And of all the people in the room, when Jesus is speaking, there was only one of them whose death was imminent. And that was Jesus himself. John chapter 14, verses 1, is when Jesus has given the Lord's Supper. He is about to go to the cross, and he gives these words of assurance and comfort to his disciples when he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now I'll stop there for one parenthesis because Thomas's question, this question from Thomas out of the blue as Jesus was speaking, perhaps maybe he rudely even interrupted Jesus when Jesus was saying, I'm going someplace, and the reason I'm going is so that you can come there too. And then Jesus says, and you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas is like, hold up, wait, hold up. We don't even know where you're going. We don't know what your plan is, even though he'd been telling them all along. So how are we supposed to know the way? I don't know where you're headed, therefore I don't know the path. And it is from Thomas's question that I think one of the greatest and most beautiful articulations of the gospel comes in verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father is it enough for us? And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And up to this point in time, we've seen through the development of the passage, John chapter 14, we have seen the person of Jesus Christ. We've been told that he is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the Father except through him. And for those people who say, well, what about dot, 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 this group of people, the answer still remains the same, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one, no one, <clears throat> not a single person, will ever come face to face in a relationship with God the Father, in a saving relationship, except through Jesus Christ, Period. Now listen, some people may say that seems very narrow. I suppose it is. Some people might say, well, what about all these other people? I don't get to question the mail, I just deliver it. Some people might say, well, that seems very exclusionistic. I said, I think you're right. That is very exclusionistic. And I don't apologize for the fact that it's exclusionistic. I don't. If you think it's narrow, then maybe it is. If you think it's exclusionistic, then maybe it is. There's bad news and there's good news, folks. The bad news is, perhaps, that Jesus has limited the way in order to access a right relationship with God the Father, and that is through his Son. That's it. If you don't like it, tough cookies. The good news is 
that you're invited. You're invited on that narrow road. Now, I, I have I've made this illustration in the past, and I think it's very helpful. At one point in time, I had the rather, and forgive me, if you're from this region of Montana and you just happen to be listening, likely not, but in case that's the case, my apologies in advance. I happen to have had the, the vast misfortune at some points in time to have done a little business in a little town called Butte, Montana. Butte, B-U-T-T-E. Uh, I threw... It's just a little bitty dot on a map in the middle of Montana. There are very few things in Butte, Montana, except a post office, a bar that is across the street, a church that is very sparsely and poorly attended, and a coffee shop that is open for two hours a day. That's all there is in Butte, Montana. And of course, Montana Light and Power, which then became the long distance company that I ended up working for and consulting for before I, uh, God called me into pastoral ministry. With all due respect, I used to call it but with an E, because that's what it was like. Now, there is only one, literally, there is only one way to get to Butte, Montana. There's only one road in, <laughs> there's only one road out. That is all you get. If you try to get to Butte, Montana any other way besides that road, you better own a helicopter, because that's the only way in and the only way out. And they don't make apologies for the fact that that's how you get there. And, and that's, that's just the way that it is. The same thing is true as God is saying with a relationship with God the Father. The difference is, of course, that having a relationship with God the Father is a delightful aspect of the Christian life. But there's only one way to get there. And that's through the person of Jesus. So we have the disclosure of the person of God in the presence of the Son. And now we see as this, pas this passage progresses, we go from the disclosure of the character of God the Father and the person of Jesus Christ the Son, the only way, to the promise of the, the foretelling promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit in verse 15. This passage encapsulates the fullness of Father, Son, and Spirit in the life of the believer. In verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now, I want you to stop there just for a second. You will see me because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Okay, how does that happen? That happens because the Spirit of truth, whom the Father, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you will know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Verse 18 is a reminder, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see me no longer, but you will see me because I live. You will also will live, and that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not be and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my word, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. <clears throat> now, I often, in the context of chaplain ministry, will quote this passage as a person is dying. And I will often say that I believe that the reason that Jesus often said, do not let your hearts be troubled neither let them be afraid is because there are times in our lives in which 
we as humans are so tempted to allow our hearts to be troubled and to be afraid. He says it twice. <clears throat> and I want, I want us to notice the two times that he says it and the way that he brackets what he is saying. <clears throat> because that phrase almost bookends this passage that leads us from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> he starts off by saying, Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Then he discloses the purposes of the Father in the presence of the Son, Jesus, and reminds people that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, right? The disclosure of the character of the Father, the presence of salvation exclusively in the Son. <clears throat> and then he wraps up his reminder to them not to allow their hearts to be troubled and not to let them be afraid by telling them that it is good that he goes because if he goes, he will send the Holy Spirit a helper who will come to be with them, who is with them and will be in them. Now, the, the idea from the disciples, the disciples grew up in a Jewish environment in which they would have understood some things about the Holy Spirit. They would have known that David was anointed by the Holy Spirit. They would have known that Paul had the Holy Spirit, but it was taken from him. They would have known that the Holy Spirit had come, across, come upon prophets of old in order to equip them and enable them to preach the word to the people. They would have known that at times the Holy Spirit would have fallen upon Moses and allowed his, his visage to be so transformed that he had to wear a veil when he came down off the mountain. But at no point in time would they have ever understood the Holy Spirit would have come to live inside a person. <clears throat> to be so close in a person's life and existence that it is figured as the Holy Spirit living in us. And yet that is exactly what Jesus is saying. That the Holy Spirit comes to be the counselor and the comforter who lives in us. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 through 5 tells us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Say that ten times fast. For we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. You see, the Holy Spirit has come to live in us and has given us <clears throat> the comfort that we need in order that we would not let our hearts be troubled or let them be afraid. See, this, this helper whom the, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send, in Jesus' name, he's the one who teaches us all things and brings to remember, remembrance everything that Jesus said, and he is called the helper or the advocate or the paraclete because he has come to bring us comfort. That's just how close <clears throat> God desires to have a relationship with you. Now, if that, if that doesn't blow your mind, you're either hyper familiar with this concept or you're not paying attention. Because as I see it, the vast majority of the, of the human religions as we see it see God as a distant person in the far off who made all this stuff, maybe kind of took the world and wound it up like a wound-up toy and then sent it on its way and looks from a distance to see maybe every now and again if there needs to be a little intervention here and there that maybe the God of the universe needs to poke the wind-up toy so that it doesn't go off track too far. It seems to be the vast majority of religions. There's God, and then there's people, and there's this huge chasm, and there's veritably no way to breach that chasm. It just is. <clears throat> and, and Christianity, unfortunately, in some senses, has incorporated some of that, some of that thinking. And so 
you, know, you, you may have grown up in some form of religious tradition that essentially assumed that God is this nameless, faceless being in the far-off distance who looks at humanity from the unapproachable chasm of a disapproving heart of his creation. <clears throat> who sits up on high with his arms folded, looking down upon the people whom he created, tisking and shying away because look at the mess that they've created. And then, and then we've sort of created this, this system. Religion has taken the gospel of Jesus Christ and so perverted it that we, we create systems in which this nameless, faceless God who looks down upon humanity from the, the unapproachable distance of a disapproving heart has Jesus who's reluctantly came to fix it all for his father. <clears throat> And the only reason that God can even look at any of us is through this disapproving heart. And, and so we must constantly work to get back right with God. Because we sort of believe, <clears throat> based upon what religion tells us, that God really doesn't like us very much. And the more that we make a mess of our lives, the more we become convinced that the farther away we should probably stay from God. Because if God is essentially the grumpy grandpa, have you ever had one of those? The grumpy grandpa? The one that they just say, leave grandpa alone because he's just grumpy? I didn't have grumpy grandpas. <clears throat> I had one grandfather who appeared grumpy, but who was actually just a softy. He taught me how to play chess, and we would play chess every time I came. He never let me win. And then eventually at 16, I won. We never played again. And then I had another grandfather. He, was, he, was, he delighted in his grandchildren, delighted in them. He was, they called him Tex, even though he'd never been to Texas. He was, his name was Warren Stuckey, and he, he was originally from Louisiana. Got his first pair of shoes when he entered the Army Air Corps. And when we would show up at his house, we could hear from inside, he'd go, ha, ha, look who come to my house. And we would have, uh, we would go on golf rides, and he taught me how to golf, and <clears throat> told me it was okay that I stunk at golf. And then we would have ice cream sandwiches in the summer on the back deck. And he would give me an ice cream sandwich and he'd give himself one at the end of his ice cream sandwich. He would say, you know what that ice cream sandwich tasted like? He said, it tasted like another. And then he'd give us another. I'm sorry if you had grumpy grandpa. <clears throat> I didn't. I had grandparents whom I knew delighted in me as their grandchild. Religion presents God as if he's the grumpy grandpa. The gospel teaches us that God delights in his children and wants to be so close to them that he sends his only son to bleed and die that we might have that chasm repaired and we can have a relationship with God. And he sends himself as the Holy Spirit to live inside the heart of all who will come to Christ. That <clears throat> is how good the good news is. The Holy Spirit is a comforter because the very presence of God has come to live inside our broken and messed up existence. It, 
if you've ever been to my house, you know that, that there, you know, there's, there's about 100 projects in my house, and they're all about 90% fixed. <clears throat> and, and, and that's just, I think, the way that we as Christians live our lives mostly. It's got, with all these broken projects in our life, and, and sometimes we're like a little embarrassed and we're like, you know, I'm going to get to that, Lord. And God's like, yeah, I know. And I'm, I'm, in, I'm really meant to fix this, God. And he's like, I, don't, I, don't, I know, I don't, I don't care. I'm not here because you fixed up the place. I'm here because I'm fixing up the place. <clears throat> I bought a toolbox once. My wife asked me why. She's like, why did you buy the toolbox? I said, she's like, you don't know how to use any of those things. I said, I need an organized place to put all the tools that I can hand to somebody else when they come to my house to fix stuff for me. Right? And, and, and that's what I think we ought to be doing with the Holy Spirit. Handing over the toolbox. Here, you fix it. I tried. Look what happened. The Holy Spirit is the counselor and the comforter for the believer, and the Holy Spirit also provides the power and presence to live a truly Christian life. You can't do it on your own. And religion will teach you that you need to live a truly and honorable Christian life in order to impress God so that God will come near to you, which is exactly backwards <clears throat> from what the gospel says. Religion says you need to live honorable lives in the presence of God, so that God will love you and care for you and bless you and come near to you. And the gospel says, you'll never do that on your own. So you need to come near to God so that he can help you live a truly honorable Christian life. And that's why 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 through 22 says this, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaim among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I was not yes and no, but in him is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. This is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our heart as a guarantee. A few things in that, sermon, that particular message, but there's two I want you to latch on to. The first one is this. And it, it is God who establishes us with you in Christ. It's not them doing the work. It's God who's doing the work. It is God who has anointed them to do what they were to do and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. A guarantee of what? That question is answered easily in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. It is the guarantee of our heavenly inheritance. Now listen, if the Holy Spirit has come to live within you and that Holy Spirit is a guarantee of your future inheritance, then we have to start asking our questions whether or not we are going to take God at his word. Do we believe that God breaks his word? When we come to a place in which we trust Christ, he says, I am with you and I'm not leaving. I am with you and the Holy Spirit is the presence in your life that comforts you and guides you and leads you and also guarantees you of a future inheritance. And we walk around as if, if we could maybe say the wrong thing and lose the inheritance. Man, listen, I'm, I'm a father, and, and, and there have been times in which I wanted to disinherit my son, but I never did. He gets to inherit all my broken stuff when I go. And there's literally nothing that he could ever do 
that would ever convince me not to give him the inheritance that he'll receive. Which ain't much, but there are a few things that I hope he'll treasure, you know, like my first Bible. And the faith that we've passed down and the very imperfect example of what it means to have a father who daily struggles to be a man of God, but who nevertheless has found solace and comfort in the midst of the struggle. And ultimately, the one thing I hope that he inherits from me is the truth that God abjectly re refuses to give up on his kids. Refuses. Religion will teach you to tiptoe around God. The gospel will tell you to continue to run back to your father. That's what life in the Spirit looks like, at least according to the book of Romans, the eighth chapter. Romans chapter 8, in my Bible, titled Life in the Spirit, which is a human synopsis, but pretty accurate in my opinion, for it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the thing of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit for to set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Now, you know, here's, why, here's why I think that there's so many times in which we shy away from teaching about the Holy Spirit because in some senses the Holy Spirit is an experiential aspect of our life that you can't just teach. How many of you have taught your children to ride a bike? You got a bunch of kids who never learned how to ride bikes in here? Okay. You taught your kid how to ride a bike. Now, there's a certain amount of instruction that you can give when you're teaching someone to ride a bike. Right? There's a certain amount of verbal instruction that you can give. Mine, mine was very brief. My great grand, my grandfather, you know, the one who said, look who come to my house. He said, Brian, and he said it this way. He said, there's essentially one rule that you need to remember when you ride a bike. It's a standard physical law. Two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. <laughs> that was all he said. That was the extent of the verbal instruction as to what it meant for me to ride a bike. Then he set me down on the bike, and he gave me a little push. And the rest of it was just momentum and trial and many errors, right? That's what it's like to learn how to ride a bike. You, you can do the 12-step plan if you want to and tell them all the things that they're supposed to do, and I suppose that that would be helpful. But ostensibly, when riding a bike, one just has to sit on the bike 
and push forward and start pedaling. It's kind of a learn while you go experience, isn't it? Because the true knowledge of how to ride a bike comes by riding a bike. And the same thing is true about living and walking with the Spirit. The true knowledge of how to walk in the Spirit comes from walking in the Spirit. There's only so much that a preacher can tell you about how to walk in the Spirit. I can tell you what it will result in. I can tell you how you have to start the process. But walking in the Spirit is something that you do by walking in the Spirit. It means daily relinquishing control of our lives to the Holy Spirit to take over and to do in us and through us what we can't do ourselves. Remi reminds me of that, that country song, you know, Jesus, take the wheel. Have you ever heard that country song? That's a fun song, and I liked it when it came out, but, you know, I'm like, at the end of the song, I'm like, okay, with all due respect, maybe you should just let Jesus drive, right? And you sit in the passenger seat, as opposed to constantly going off the road and then throw up your hands and going, Jesus, take the wheel. Wouldn't it be easier, you know, just to sit in the back and let Jesus drive? The, the whole idea is God's in control. We're not in control. The Holy Spirit's in control. We're not in control. That's what it means to walk in the Spirit. And it's why then Paul says in verse 12, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might also be glorified with him. And listen, there's a whole lot of what it means to be walking by the Spirit, but verse 15 is very informative, for it says, you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. And yet, I believe that the way that religion treats the gospel is constantly to point us back to fear. I mean, I don't, I don't, there are some people, and I have been to some of these churches, I don't know why you bother to go back. Come to church, it's a fear-based experience. You're told that God looks at you from an infinite distance of a disapproving heart. And then you've got a person up front who threatens you for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Shape up. Get better. And you walk out the door feeling beat up. And I fear that I've done that. And for that I repent. It's not the gospel. Now, the Spirit of God living in our lives doesn't bring us back to fear. It just reminds us of what Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid. Here's the Father, here's his character. Look at me, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You want to see the Father? You come through me. And I go, and when I go, I send the helper, the comforter, the counselor who will live in you and will live with you and it will be in you. And he's not there to constantly remind you of how messed up you are. You've got plenty of things that can do that in your life. 
No, he's there to bring you gentle rebuke when you need it and comfort when you desperately need it, all the while reminding you that God has become your father. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons. He says you don't have to tiptoe around God. And you run to his presence. Because he's the guy who's teaching you how to ride the bike. Galatians 5, 16 through 26 underscores this whole point when he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You want to know how to live a godly life? Live it in the Spirit. You try to live it by a, a list of do's and don'ts, you'll just fall flat on your face all the time. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It's very interesting. Not once in this passage does he say, if you walk by the principles of godliness, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He never says that because in order for us to walk by principles of godliness, we need to do so in accompaniment with the Spirit. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, as if that just wasn't enough. I don't know about you, but in our culture, that just seems like Saturday night for some people. And then the latter part of it seems like Sunday morning for others. I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, and that would be bad news. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. The whole point is, if you want to live the kind of life that Jesus says is truly honorable, there's only one way to do that, and that is to live it in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Try to do it on your own. You'll, you'll just end up a pretender. You'll just end up with the philosophy that maybe you can fake it till you make it. The problem with faking it till you make it is you never make it. I've told the story before, I'm sorry, I hate mimes. Anybody here a mime? Good. Can't stand mimes. I've always thought, I've always been suspicious of mimes. I never trust a mime. I don't like clowns either, but of all the kinds of clowning, miming is the worst kind of clowning, okay? And uh, when I worked in, in Denver, Colorado, I would go into downtown Denver and there would be a mime, and somehow they just know I don't like them. Hmm. And so I'm walking to work, and behind me, walking in the same way as a stupid mime. Right? And I turn around and look at him, and he'd look at me like I'm looking at him. And one, it's against the law, so I can't do anything. And two, I'm a Christian, so I can't do anything. But I can't stand the mime. But there was one time I was mildly amused by the mime. And that is when he was stopped following me, and he started following this other guy who was listening to a Walkman. It was back in the day when they actually had the Walkman, you know, when there was no Bluetooth and you had the wires. Right? And this guy was walking down Denver and he was bebopping to the music and the mime was walking behind him exactly the same way and I thought, that's funny. And then God taught me a lesson through that. You know what I learned? You know what the difference between the guy who's bebopping to the music is and the mime? They're walking the same way. They're doing the same actions. You know what the difference is? The guy hears the music. That's the difference. The mime's just copying the guy. If 
Folks, that's the difference between walking with the Spirit and just miming Christians. The guy hears the music. He hears the voice of the Spirit who calls him to live in a certain way. And there are whole religions, so-called Christian religions, that are based on just copy what people do when they hear the music instead of inviting people to hear the music. Jesus, I think, was trying to teach that point to a guy named Nicodemus in the third chapter of the book of John. John chapter 3, starting in the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, the Word, that's John 1. It's going to take us a while to get to John 3 if I start there. John 3, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus was telling Nicodemus, who was a teacher of Israel, that to have a genuine and authentic life and to really be able to even see the kingdom of God, to be able to lay eyes on what the kingdom of God looks like, you have to be born again of the Spirit of God. That's what it means to be born again. To have the Holy Spirit of God come to live inside you, to be your comforter, the one who guides you, the one who teaches you, the one who gives you peace the one who sets you on the path to walk, the one who constantly encourages you to take the next step with him. It is what Paul would later call the regeneration and renewal of the Spirit. Paul says that in the book of Titus in the third chapter, starting in verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, and there's two things. The first one is it doesn't mean that we don't actually end up living lives that are worth living. Of course it does. Paul was careful to point out that we as Christians must devote ourselves to good works, but he backs that up and says that that does not give us access to God. It does not impress God. It does not help us to get to know the Holy Spirit. It is a result of having been regenerated and renewed by the Holy Spirit. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, not because of that, but according to His own mercy. How did God choose to save us? By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior.
So if there's any pastoral advice as to what it means to walk in the Spirit, we have to maybe start by listening to the Holy Spirit. Maybe that means that some of our prayer time is less characterized by our own unburdening to God and more by asking God what it is that he would have us to hear. If you're like me, prayer sometimes becomes more monologue than it is a dialogue. Does that happen to you every now and again? Oh, God, I need this, and I want this, and I want this, and I need this, and I need this, and oh, look at that, that's messed up, God. Sometimes my own prayers sound like I'm newscasting for God, like he just doesn't know, right? Oh, God, the world is so terrible, and look at this, and how awful this is, and this is how many people were hurt, and, you know, in my more lucid moments, I'm thinking, God's like, yeah, I know, Mm mm-hmm, I know, Uh uh-huh, yeah, I already know that part, yep, got that, oh, so-and-so is struggling, you don't say, so-and-so has this, right? Constantly informing God. Constantly, listen, I get in many ways that's just our own personal way of helping us to reflect on what's really going on. So I'm not condemning anybody for doing it. But in some sense, it really is silly when we start telling God all the details as if he needs us to tell him, right? And, but the, the problem is every now and again, that just becomes the fullness of the prayer. And I get done informing God about all the things that are wrong and asking him politely if he could please fix it for us, and then I end the conversation. Thanks, God. I'll get back to you again tonight. And God's like, wait, 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 I got, I got, no, sorry, don't have time to hear you. I'm busy, and I just, I just made my request. Could you, you know, politely get to work on these, and I'll check in with you tonight. And God's like, whoa, 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 but I got, maybe, you're like, no, no, that's nice. I'm sure you have plenty of valuable things to say, but I've just given you the recitation of all the things that you need to work on so if you wouldn't mind getting on those, and I'll check in later. And God's like, but, it, it, you know what I mean? Is that your prayer time every now and again? Sure is mine every now and again. And writing this sermon has just kind of reminded me politely, pastorally, shut up. Come to God. Unburden what you need to unburden. Ask God to speak to you and then listen. Because God has done something remarkable to every one of us who has come to Christ. He has revealed the person of the Father through the Son. He has brought us through the narrow way, the way, the truth, and the life, and has brought us into the very center of what it means to have a relationship with God. And He has not left us as orphans in this world, but rather has sent Himself, the Holy Spirit, to live within us, to comfort us, to guide us, to teach us, to make us new, and to constantly make us new, to give us peace, to teach us how to live. I believe that the Holy Spirit speaks constantly and we just need to quiet our souls long enough to listen sometimes. And respectfully, when a group of people who call themselves Christians start listening to the Spirit, then together they can come together and they have so much power to affect real and genuine change in the lives of other people. 
We can start to accomplish this grand vision of this great commission that Jesus has given us. Start to teach us how to walk in the midst of this world in which we live that neither cares nor respects the God that we serve. And we can do it all while not allowing our hearts to be troubled. Neither letting them be afraid. So let's take a minute and pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, we are grateful for your grace. And I pray for those in this room who may not yet have come to a place in their life in which they've embraced the Lord and Savior, Jesus. And I pray that you will do your work in their heart in this moment. And I pray for those who have that we may continue to tune our ears to the sound and voice of the Holy Spirit in our life. Listen, if there's never been that time in your life in which you've come to faith in Christ, here, here's maybe an occasion in which it's time to start listening to the Holy Spirit of God. Because the first work that the Holy Spirit does in a person's life is to draw him to the truths of the gospel, to convict him or her of those truths, and then to bring that person to faith. And if that's something you want to do today, then I'm going to just utter a simple prayer. You don't, you don't have to pray exactly these words. You pray however God inspires you to pray. But it's a prayer of, of repentance and a prayer of confidence in all of the things that we've talked about today. And if you've never come to that place, would you pray with me? Dear Lord God, I know I can't live this life apart from you. I've tried faking it till I make it, and it doesn't work. Father, I know that left to my own devices, I would heap things upon my life, sins that I would commit and shame that would be washed upon me. And I am grateful for the fact that your son Jesus bled and died on a cross that I might be forgiven of those things. And so I confess right now that the Lord Jesus is in fact Lord and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead by the power of the Spirit. And in this moment, Holy Spirit, I ask that you will grab a hold of my life and lead me from this day forward. And for those of us who have prayed that prayer or something like it in the past, might we simply utter this word, Holy Spirit, would you make room in our lives for your voice? And now, congregation, would you take just about a minute to listen to the voice of God?
And now as we sing, let us do so as those who have been brought by hand into the throne room to glorify God who loves us, who will never leave us and forsake us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Thank you, Brian. Stand and sing with us for him, I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me, Jesus is love. Boy, there's a lot to that song. And I try to, every time I sing that, I get to the, I must tell Jesus too soon. Jesus is going to help me, have to help me sing that song, because I'm not going to get it right on my own, or anything else. And, um, and that's good news. 
Father in heaven, I thank you for these people. They are the ones that you have purchased by the blood of your son. I thank you for these people because they have chosen the way, the truth, and the life. They have chosen to come to the Father through your son. I thank you because by your grace, you have given them the power of the Holy Spirit in their life to live lives that bring glory to you, comfort that was without bounds, power that is infinite, and a sense of assurance that cannot be taken from them. And I pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. If you want to give to the ongoing work of Baptist Fellowship, there's a box in the back. We love you and we'll see you next week.